Today on Face the Nation, Vice President Joe Biden. He's live from the Winter Olympics in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. But the questions will be all about the administration's handling of terrorism, congressional gridlock, and the latest broadsides from his predecessor, Dick Cheney. It's all next on Face the Nation. Face the Nation with CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer. And now from CBS News in Washington, Bob Schieffer. And good morning once again. The Vice President is with us live in Vancouver this morning, heading the U.S. delegation to the Olympics. And last night, Mr. Vice President, in a taped interview with NBC, you began an extraordinary exchange with your predecessor, former Vice President Dick Cheney. Knowing that he was going to be on ABC this morning, you took a preliminary swipe at him, saying he was either misinformed or misinforming and was trying to rewrite history. Well, I have to tell you, Mr. Vice President, he did not disappoint. He lit into you this morning for <laughs> misunderstanding the threat posed by Al-Qaeda when you told Larry King you didn't believe that Al-Qaeda was planning a 9-11 level attack on this country. He said they are trying to get a nuclear weapon and will use it if they do get one. Listen to this. I think, in fact, the uh, situation with respect to uh, Al Qaeda to say that you know that was a big attack we had on 9/11, but it, it's not likely again. I just think that's dead wrong. I think the biggest strategic threat the United States faces today is the possibility of another 9/11 with a nuclear weapon or a biological agent of some kind, and I think Al Qaeda is out there even as we meet trying to figure out how to do that. I think they need to do everything they can to prevent it, and uh, if the mindset is it's not likely. Uh, then it's difficult to mobilize the resources and get people to give it the kind of priority that it deserves. So, Mr. Vice President, are you underestimating the uh, threat posed to this country by al-Qaeda? No, but I always underestimate the way uh, Dick Cheney approaches things. The reason it's unlikely is we, because we have been relentless absolutely relentless in isolating al-Qaeda, central al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, al-Qaeda coming out of the, uh, the uh, Afghan-Pakistan region. We agree the worst nightmare is the possession of nuclear weapons or a radiological weapon by al-Qaeda. That's why we put incredible resources. We've had significant success. <clears throat> We've eliminated over a dozen of their top 20 operatives, another hundred of their associates. We have been relentless in our effort to deal with keeping them isolated. They've been unable to operate in any significant coordinated way. That's why you're seeing Al-Qaeda metastasize into smaller bore operations coming out of the Arabian Peninsula, <clears throat> not directly co coordinated by them. So, so you do I not- I don't know what Dick doesn't understand. The, the, the worry is legitimate. The reason why I do not think it's likely is because of all the resources we have put on this, considerably more than the last administration did, to see to it that it will not happen. And in addition to that, <clears throat> we are in the process, and the president has put me in charge of it, for a plan to corral loose nuclear weapons and fissile material within the next four years, something the last administration paid virtually no attention to. So because we know that is the ultimate weapon in the hands of Al-Qaeda, we have used an incredible number of resources to isolate them, continue to stay on them, and to focus on their inability to plan. Uh, but you know, Mr. Vice President, for all of that, and mm. you say that you are relentless, here a guy whose own father tried to turn him in to our Central Intelligence Agency, managed to get onto an aircraft that was coming to the United States. I'm talking about the Christmas Day bomber. Listen to what the Vice President had to say about that. The thing I learned from watching that process unfold, though, was that the administration really wasn't equipped to deal with the aftermath of an attempted attack against the United States in the sense that they didn't know what to do with the guy. Didn't know what to do with him. You know, I <laughs> I don't know what Dick's been doing lately. I don't know. Uh, um, uh, we did exactly what he did with the shoe bomber, Richard Reeve. Exactly what he did. 
We brought in the experts. I, I was told he said we didn't, didn't bring in the right people. The experts are the FBI interrogators. They are the best that we have. We brought them in immediately. <clears throat> they were in his custody. They got all the information they could get from him prior to him going silent. Once he, <clears throat> once he went silent, he was read his Miranda rights and put in the system. Since he's been in the system, he's continued to talk because we have handled him in a way that encouraged him to talk. His family has come over. They've encouraged him to talk. We continue to get significant information from him. I was told, I don't know if this is true in the briefing, that, that, uh, that Dick lamented the fact or made some reference to the fact we should have kept waterboarding on the table. You saw how much success they got from that. The irony here is <clears throat> that's exactly what was done with Masawi, the 21st uh, uh, hijacker. That was exactly what was done with Richard Reeves. That was exactly what was done under the Cheney administration that he defended. And now he finds this somehow uh, uh, an extraordinary measure, which happens to work, that he doesn't like. Well, let I me, don't get it. Well, let me just, so you can hear it, you said you heard this is what he said. Here's what he said. But you believe they should have had the option of everything up to and including waterboarding. I think you ought to have all of those capabilities on the table. So? so I, that's Dick Cheney. I mean, thank God the, the last administration didn't listen to him at the end. But, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean I, look, we got, we got incredible amounts of information. We're continuing to get the information. Uh, we got information from Richard Reeves that resulted in a, in a guilty plea. He's in jail, not able to get out. I mean, I am absolutely, uh, uh, you know, I was trying to, I was asked last night or this morning on a show, what was this all about with Dick Cheney? And I, I said, I never, I never questioned another man's motive. But then I also heard that uh, he got into saying he disagreed with the last administration, with, with, uh, with the last attorney general, Republican attorney general. So I think his fight seems to be with the last administration. We did exactly what President Bush did. We got the similar result. We are protecting America. Uh, and I don't know. It seems like Dick Cheney can't take yes for an answer. Well, uh, he did say many of those things uh, in this interview because uh, we watched it this morning. But I, I just want to go back to this. We heard the former pre uh, vice president of the United <coughs> States saying torture, what we have uh, many people define as torture, waterboarding, I think he calls it in enhanced interrogation, uh, should have been one of the options. Can you, uh, Mr. Vice President, ever envision a time when uh, waterboarding should be used on anyone? No. 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 It's wanna, not effective. It's not effective. Uh, Correct. It's not effective. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the trial of uh, Sheikh Khalid uh, Mohammed. Uh, which yes. was scheduled to be, be held in New York. Uh, the attorney general said they were going to do that. He thought this would set an example for the world. Then suddenly, uh, after the election of Scott Brown in Massachusetts, who said we ought to be spending money catching terrorists, not spending money to make sure they had a lawyer to defend them and talking about civilian <laughs> trials and all of that, uh, suddenly the mayor of New York said, we don't need to do this. We don't want it in New York. And uh, mm. all the other politicians came along. Now we understand from the White House that they are going to move it someplace else. And the attorney general the other day did leave open the possibility that they might go back and try him in a military tribunal. What can you tell us about that? Well, I can tell you two things. I don't know whether the new senator from Massachusetts understands when you get tried in a military tribunal, you get a lawyer too. So it's good if we begin to learn the facts about all these things. You get a lawyer whether you're in a military tribunal or whether you're in a federal court, number one. <clears throat> the attorney general decided that the court with the biggest, with the greatest venue, with the best the jurisdiction was the New York court. That was the right decision to make. In the meantime, the political circumstances changed. The mayor came along and said the cost providing security to hold this trial is X hundreds of millions of dollars, which I think is much more than would be needed. And the elected officials, Democrat and Republican, said we don't want this tried here in New York. 
that creates a, a political dimension to this in the sense that the Congress can control the cost and the purse springs of how much money we have to try this case. So that's the only reason why the president is taking it under consideration. To det we have no doubt that the best, most effective legal way to put this guy behind bars for the longest time and get the most information with the most uh, certainty is in an Article III court. But the president is now waiting for a recommendation from the attorney general to see as after review whether we have the option to continue there or have to consider another option. Last point, Bob. We have significantly, with the help of some people like Lindsey Graham and others in the, in the United States Senate, uh, we have beefed up these military courts so that they can pass constitutional scrutiny so that if we have to have a trial in one of those courts, it will pass the test of our constitutional requirements. So it is a possibility, but let me put it in, this in perspective. There have been three people tried and convicted by the last administration in military courts. Two are walking the street right now. There have been over 300 tried in federal courts by the last administration and by us. They're all in jail now. None of them are out seeing the light of day. So this idea that somehow if you get tried in a military court, the punishment is greater, or if you get tried in the civil court, it, I mean, a criminal court, it is less, is the opposite. But are you leaving open the possibility that this, that uh, Khalid Sheikh <clears throat> Mohammed may be tried in a military tribunal and not in a civilian court because that's a question uh, that most that people are asking questions about right now. No. I think it's a legitimate question and that's one we're considering right now based upon you are what our considering options are you are well, considering we are that. still well, we, we have to consider it because we don't know what political constraints can be placed on us in terms of the cost of trying the case in a criminal court in the federal system, but that is still our preference. Uh, I'm going to uh, play one more soundbite from the uh, vice president, the former vice president here on this very, uh, very subject. He goes back to Good. what the the, the <clears throat> argument he was making in the beginning. He said it's the idea of the mindset of this administration. Uh, listen to this. It's the mindset <clears throat> that concerns me, John. I think it's it's. Very important to go back and, and keep in mind the distinction between handling these events as criminal acts, which is the way we did before 9-11, and then looking at 9-11 and saying this is not a criminal act, not when you destroy 16 acres of Manhattan, kill 3,000 Americans, blow a big hole in the Pentagon. That's an act of war. So there you are. So why are we even thinking about trying them in, in civilian courts if it is an act of war, uh, Mr. Vice President? It is an act of war, what took place. Our objective is to make sure they pay the highest price possible for the inhumanity they visited upon our country. Whatever for is the best way to do that is what should be done. Now look, the fact of the matter is, the bulk of the people who were tried by a, any court in this country under the last administration were tried in a federal criminal court and they're still in jail. Those tried in military courts, some were not convicted, some were convicted and they're now out, and others the last administration released and released them into Yemen and are the very people we're fighting now. So I don't quite get what the objective here is. I don't care what you call it. I want that son of a, son of a gun who was involved in harming an American and American interest to pay with being incarcerated and or in some cases their life for the damage they did to an American citizen or to our country for as long as we can possibly make it. And you in think... In the recent past, that has been in a criminal court system that in fact is the envy of the world and the fear of the terrorist. Do you believe that in whatever court uh, <clears throat> Sheikh Mohammed is tried, this mastermind of 9-11, are you confident he'll be found guilty? Looking at the evidence that's been made available to me as part of the, in a generic sense, the executive branch of the prosecuting team, I am absolutely convinced. I am absolutely convinced he will be put away for a long, long time. Let me uh, ask you this, uh, Mr. Vice President. You said the other night uh, to Larry King in an interview that you thought Iraq could be one of the great achievements of this administration. And I must say, a lot of people, when you said that, said uh, their response was, what? 
uh, this administration didn't have very much to do with the rock and and your friend Dick Cheney had had a had a thought about that as well so let's listen to that I bet he did for them to try to take credit uh, for what's happened in Iraq strikes me as a little strange if they're gonna take credit for it fair enough uh, for what they've done while they're there but it ought to go with a healthy dose of thank you George Bush up front so your response to that? Look, one. we're not we're not we're not taking credit. We had to take responsibility. When we took responsibility for the mess that we were handed to us at the end of last year, an awful lot of very informed news people like you or Bob were wondering whether or not that country could be put together. From the beginning, I've been on your show so many times in the previous years, and my mantra was, this requires a political solution. I never once doubted that additional American forces would, in fact, meet the military objective of settling things down. But nothing would matter. We would not be able to leave unless there was a political accommodation. What we did, and we did responsibly from the day we took office, is put that in motion. I have been to Iraq four times this year, 14 times already. I have met with every single solitary one of the players in Iraq, Sunni, Shia, Kurd, uh, a Christian, and we have been able to be a catalyst for them moving from settling their political differences on boundaries, on territory, on oil, et cetera, from the battlefield to the political arena. And so I think we've managed it very, very well. I think we're going to be able to be out of Iraq with all of our combat troops, 90,000 by the end of August. I think we'll be out leaving behind an electorate that had just put in place a parliament that is viewed as legitimate across the board. And we'll be able to get out of Iraq at the end of 2011, leaving behind a stable government. Now, anybody who tells you, including Dick Cheney, that they knew how they were going to get there January of last year, I would find it somewhat surprising. I'll give them, I don't care who gets credit. My generic point is we have managed this very well thus far. The Iraqis have done really good work. If this works, it will be a great credit to the Iraqis and a great credit to our military and civilian leadership that we've moved to the point that a nation that was in chaos is now a nation not needing American forces, having an economic and well, political relationship with the United you, States and do you, democracy. Do you think also that George Bush would also need a little thanks for that? I mean, does he share in the credit or not? Well, uh, sure. I, I'm happy to thank okay. George Bush. I like George Bush. Um, but I, I think the thing, and all the, if you go back and think about it, all we've right. been on so many of your programs, it was constantly, what is their political plan? All right. What all were right. they going to do? All right. We're going to have to break there. We'll be back in a Back now live with uh, Vice President Joe Biden. Mr. Vice President, uh, Barack Obama came to Washington and said he was going to change things. But I have to admit, as I look around, I don't see much change. The partisanship is meaner than ever. The uh, Congress is completely uh, in gridlock now. You've got a jobs bill up there that uh, even the Democrats can't figure out what they want to be in it. Uh, whose fault is this where we find ourselves right now? Well, I'd rather not uh, talk about fall. I'd rather try to figure out how to change it. And two things have to change, Bob. You and I have been around a long, long time. I think you would agree. I'm not trying to get you. I shouldn't say get you in this. Most people would agree that the United States Senate has never acted as consistently as they have to require a supermajority that is 60 votes to get anything done. That's a fundamental shift. I was there for 36 years. I don't ever recall it being abused and used as much as it has now, number one. Number two, <clears throat> I think that uh, um, what is happening now is uh, um, we find ourselves in a position where everyone knows we've been brought back from the brink. Uh, we were hemorrhaging 740,000 jobs back in January. Now it's down to a trickle. We're still losing jobs, but we will be creating jobs on a monthly basis beginning this spring. Bring some hope to the American people that we're on the right path. <clears throat> and we're getting you know, a new commitment to invest in creating jobs by investing in 
small businesses and tax credits, they hire people, et cetera. Uh, our focus has but to Mr. be But Mr. Vice jobs. President, if I could just interrupt you, I mean, the Congress can't even agree on that. Even the Democrats can't agree on a, on a jobs bill. It looks like that's going nowhere right now. Well, no, I, I, I think that's wrong. I, I think it is going somewhere. What Harry Reid decided to do was take a jobs bill where he could get a bi... The first bill he wanted to pass was a bipartisan bill where the Republicans signed on for the first time and said there's a need to do something here. And that's what Harry wants to pass first. <clears throat> that includes tax credits, that includes business incentives, et cetera. And his objective is, and no one ever thought there'd be one single job bill, we thought this spring it'll be a series of initiatives that promote American workers to provide access to good jobs and to provide access to credit, which a lot of small businesses or credit worthy are being strangled and so this is a process and it's 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 beginning in the meantime the recovery act is moving on and we are continuing to create jobs there uh, and uh, but the bottom line here is that we've gone from inheriting an economy that shrunk six percent the month we came into office to one that's growing at six percent now uh, we're beginning to turn the corner and we got to focus on the needs of ordinary people that's why All the right. president is talking about helping people with college education, retirement, et cetera. Mr. Vice President, we have to stop it right there. Thank you so much uh, for being with us this Thank morning. You. I'll be back in a moment with some final thoughts. Finally, on Valentine's Day, a question to contemplate. What is the most powerful sentence in the English language? I think it is this one, and it's not a long sentence, but a very short one, only three words, I love you. Like nearly all the things we value most in life, it describes something that cannot be touched, only felt. I wrote a little verse about it once in answer to a question. A child's question asked of me, if I can't see it, can it be? I see my toy, I know it's there, I feel my arm, I touch my hair. These are things I know to be. But what of things I cannot see? What are the wind? Where does it go? Are there other things to know? Oh yes, my dear, and soon you'll find they're locked inside the heart and mind. Sweet love's desire, a mother's prayer, more real than all we see out there, more real than sun and moon and rain, at first much harder to explain. The only thing that I can say, I say it now in just this way, what is real and what is not? Love is real, the rest is not. Happy Valentine.